Lord of the feast, you have prepared a table before all peoples and poured out your life with abundance. Call us again to your banquet. Strengthen us by what is honorable, just, and pure, and transform us into a people of righteousness and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Philippians. My brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge you, Odia, and I urge Thinkthee, to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. The Word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. And then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad, so the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. How many of you have a favorite Bible verse? It's a show of hands. If you have a favorite verse of the Bible. Some, yeah. Yeah, maybe a favorite passage, a favorite story out of the Bible, perhaps. For some, that favorite might, you know, be the same thing for the majority of your life. Maybe it's been a favorite of yours for years and years. And maybe for some of you, you have a favorite Bible verse for a season, for a time in your life. You know, for the last few months, a particular Bible verse is standing out for you and it becomes your favorite. I hope each one of you does have a favorite part of the Bible that is that speaks to you and if you don't open up your bible and start reading and I, i'm always happy to help to guide people in in scripture to to find what is speaking to you now well today we are concluding our four-week journey through philippians those four chapters of philippians i won't ask you for a show of hands to see who accepted my invitation to actually read the, the book of philippians with me together but i hope uh, many of you have well, today's passage of Philippians contains my favorite passage of Scripture, a little gem tucked away here in the fourth chapter of Philippians, this brief passage where it seems that Paul is bringing it all down to the elemental heart of Christian life, what it is like to live life in the presence of Christ. And to bring this passage down to its most simple elements, there's the three words that seem to sum it all up, joy, peace, and love. 
joy, peace, and love. Paul says to the church in Philippi, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That speaks to my heart, and I hope it speaks to yours as well. And all that, those couple sentences distill down into joy and peace and love. So if you've been reading the whole of Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, maybe you'll have noticed how often Paul says that he rejoices in them. He rejoices in his own life. Rejoicing even though he's in prison, he's still rejoicing, and he's calling the church in Philippi to rejoice even though they're suffering as well. Paul rejoices and encourages them, encouraging them to be of the same mind as that of Christ Jesus. Remember that from the second chapter of Philippians. To be of the same mind of Christ Jesus, who was sent from God in humble service and self-giving love. And in, in saying those things, Paul is outlining for, outlining for us what it means to live a life in Christ. What, is to like, what it's like to live in Christ's presence, rejoicing of all, in all things humbly rejoicing. So it's important to be clear here where Paul talks about rejoicing when he speaks of joy in God. He's not talking about being happy. He's not talking about happiness. Happiness is when we are enjoying our circumstances, when we're in a good mood, and basically things are working out pretty well. A job that you like, a healthy family, a, an enjoyable vacation, when there's no global pandemic, you know, things are when we're feeling happy or less. But that's a fleeting thing, happiness. Happiness depends on life's circumstances. Happiness depends on the winds of fortune. But when Paul speaks of joy, he's talking about the deep peace of knowing God in Christ, the deep joy that is with us even when we are undergoing suffering, even when we are in the midst of a global pandemic and we can't do the things that we want to do and be safe, and to respect others, and to keep others safe. The deep joy that's with us even when we're suffering like Paul was experiencing in prison. The deep joy God places so deeply inside of you, like a fire burning warmly, that the changes and chances of life can't extinguish it. A light that God lights in you that fortune cannot extinguish. It's a deep peace of knowing the love of God in Christ, especially when life is hard, like it is now. A deep peace precisely when the end of your rope is in sight. Joy is the assurance that your life rests in the love of God in Christ, the contentment that Christ is your all in all. A deep peace knowing that in all things, in all circumstances, the God of love is with you, is present with you. For this Christ whom we are coming to know is the one who humbled himself, like Paul wrote in the second chapter, the one who humbled himself even to the point of death on a cross. This Jesus whom we come to know more and more is the one who knows all of our sufferings, the one who is with us in our griefs, the one who brings us to the light of a new resurrection life when we find ourselves at our weakest inability to cope. Knowing this one, this Christ, brings us the deep, deep joy that no circumstance of our life can extinguish. The joy Paul writes of is the deep peace of knowing God in Christ Jesus. The deep peace of knowing Christ. Peace, this is, this is the shalom that Paul knew so well. The, the Hebrew word for shalom, peace is shalom. He talked about this then in the third chapter. Paul, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, Paul spoke of the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. This shalom, that means wholeness. It means a wholeness of life, goodness, and peace, a peace that only God can give, a deep wholeness, knowing Christ. When something that was in us, or something that we has one, had once been missing in us, we didn't know what was missing, but it was filled with God's love. A wholeness that was only, can only be filled by Christ. 
And in coming to be of the same mind of Christ, like we heard two weeks ago in the second chapter, we find ourselves in a deepening relationship with Christ. As we spend time in prayer, being in conversation with Christ, and listening for a response from God. As we spend time with scripture, we come to learn more of Christ and his ways. You know, who did Christ have his meals with and spend his time with? How did Christ bring God's love into the world? We spend time with scripture and we spend time in prayer. So we're having those, uh, we're receiving our midweek emails with daily lectionary readings and scripture and, and prayer requests. As we spend daily time in Bible and prayer, we begin to recognize the presence of Christ today in ourselves, but also in others. And we become more and more aware of the presence of Christ in our daily lives, and so become deeper into relationship with God. And we find ourselves coming to know that peace of God guarding our hearts. We come to know the deep joy in the Lord. There's another little nugget tucked away here in these verses of Philippians. It gets overlooked sometimes with the rejoice in the Lord always. Look at verse 5. Verse 5 in chapter 4 of Philippians. It says, Let your gentleness be known. The Lord is near. Let your gentleness be known. We're a society that sometimes elevates the rough and the tough and the the people who got it all together and people who are going to be forcefully moving their way through life. Paul says, let your gentleness be known. The Lord is near. A way of living in the world with others. The Greek word there is epiakis. Epiakis. It's translated as gentleness here, which begins to get at the meaning, but there's a much fuller sense of it. It denotes a peaceful, generous openness of yourself. A peaceful, generous openness of yourself. That's a characteristic of Christ himself. Another translation could be, let your consideration of others be known. The Lord is near. Let your epiakis be known. Your generosity of spirit and openness of self to others. The joy that Paul wants us to know is not a self-serving thing. But it is expressed. It does something. It acts in this world. The joy that Paul is rejoicing in is an active joy. It is an active peace. It's sharing Christ's love and having in, in the, then the consideration of others that Christ had for others, we then give. Love that is humble, love that does not insist on its own way, as he wrote later to the Corinthians. It does not demand its own satisfaction. It does not demand glory. It considers others through the eyes of Christ. Let your gentleness be known. The Lord is near. And here, too, the peace of God is with us, the deep, flowing peace. There's a favorite Christian writer I have, Friedrich Biekner. Are you familiar with Friedrich Biekner and his writings? Yeah, yeah. He has this to say about God's peace. He writes, Peace has come to mean the time when there aren't any wars, or even when there aren't any major wars. Beggars can't be choosers. We'd most of us settle for that. But in Hebrew, peace, shalom, means fullness, means having everything you need to be holy and happily yourself. One of the titles by which Jesus is known is Prince of Peace. And he used the word himself in what seems at first glance to be two radically contradictory utter utterances. On one occasion, he said to the disciples, do not think that I have come, come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. And later on, the last time they ate together, he said to them, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. The contradiction is resolved when you realize that for Jesus, peace seems to have meant not the absence of struggle, but the presence of love. Peace is not the absence of struggle, but the presence of love. In this real world living in the way of Christ does not give rewards, not the rewards of a human society. Human society rarely thanks you for living in a countercultural way of Christ. Living out the gospel is rarely easy. It is rarely the easier path. So we struggle. 
There are constant pressures from within and without in this world to conform to the way of the world. Do not let your gentleness be known. But even and especially in that struggle, there is peace. For the peace of God isn't the absence of struggle, but the presence of God, the presence of God, who is love. God is with you always and ever, and God's love never fails. God's peace is with us because the God of peace is with us. So rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice in your happiness. Rejoice, for God is with you. In your struggles, rejoice, for God is with you. In your sorrows, rejoice, for God is with you. Always and in all things, rejoice, for the God of peace gives you God's peace, God's wholeness, God's own new resurrection life out of the jaws of death. Rejoice in the Lord, for you are in the presence of the living God, the God of love. Amen. So now with confidence in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Gracious host, fill your church with a spirit of joyous hospitality. We pray for bishops, pastors, teachers, church leaders, and all children of God as they invite others to your table of boundless grace. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious host, as you set a table in the presence of enemies, so bless the efforts of diplomats, international peace workers, and all world leaders who navigate conflict. May they proceed with dialogue and understanding so that justice and peace prevail. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious host, let your gentleness be known among those who are weary or ill, especially Kenny and Sandy and Trent, Harry and Willie and Judy, Azure, Butch, Sandy, Carol and Ann, Wayne and Elva and TJ, Pam, Tom, Ken, Rachel, Jerry, Naomi and David, Harold, Darcy, Penny, Marty and Dwight, Ron, Tammy, Ruth, Gary and Bev, Ken and Lois, Rick, Maria, Dick and Walt, Red and Dee Dee, Sue, Ruth Ann, Marcus and Denise, Kobe and Michelle and Marcus, Reagan, Julie, Irenice and Linda and Skye, Caleb and Grant, Ryan and Sean and CJ, and all those we name before you, either silently or out loud. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious host, as we remember those who have died and are gathered at the heavenly banquet, comfort us with your presence. Assure us of your peace at all times, Lord, in your mercy. Gracious host, you have set before us these gifts of your good creation. Prepare us for your heavenly banquet, nourish us with this rich food and drink, and send us forth to set tables in the midst of a suffering world, Lord, in your mercy. Listen as we call on you, O God, and enfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And at this time in the service, we, when we set the table for communion, I invite you to prepare your communion elements. And as we do that, we pray. We lift up this prayer. As the grains of wheat once scattered on the hill were gathered into one to become our bread, so may all your people from all the ends of earth be gathered into one in you. Let this be a foretaste of all that is to come when all creation shares this feast with you. Amen. I invite you to hold up your bread. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. 
Don't eat it yet. Hold on to it. And now I invite you to hold up your wine or your grape juice if you have that. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. The body and blood of Christ, given and shed for you. And now we all eat and drink. And as you replace your masks and finish, <clears throat> let us now pray the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us to pray, singing. Now bow your hearts to God and receive God's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now go and serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted, honor all people, love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we all say together, thanks be to God. <laughs>